very deeply. The body of the blade is much wider than the cutting edge in the bottom, so I have to... It's not cutting anymore. It can't reach the cut, so I have to saw a second groove next to that. Which takes very little time, and then get in deeper and continue my cut. And yes, the wood is looking very good under here, quite solid. This may seem like a lot of work, but remember, there are only two ends. I probably spent three to four hours shaping each end. And once I'm down with my knife cut, I can again chip away that last bit of wood with the ads. And it's looking very good under there. I've got a large crack I'm approaching. And I'm going to be very careful to see that I don't split the ends off from that crack continue like this until we actually have removed all of the burnt material and all the cracks that were caused by the fire. But the fire has done much work and saved us much time. Finishing touches on the, the bottom and ends of the boat are complete. It's actually reached the size that it will be in the finished boat. We may do a little more work much later, but not much. The ends are beautifully curved. And the reason to get it like this is so that in the next stages, when we remove wood from the top side, the other side, we'll kind of have a frame of reference from the finished boat itself. There are a couple of things I want to do since I won't see this side of the boat for a very long time. There are some cracks that I want to seal up with some natural materials. Many things could have been used, but one that I like, since it's totally waterproof, is pine pitch pitch of a pine tree. This is from a pine tree that comes from about a half a mile from here. And the blob was just sitting there in the trunk from a damaged damaged branch last winter. And it's totally waterproof. And I've rubbed it on several of the cracks. And I'll do that to several more. You may be thinking that I'm so concerned with moisture that I want this log to stay wet forever. That's not true. I just want the bottom to stay wet until the inside of the canoe, which is not yet shaped, starts to dry. There's nothing to rubbing this on. It's a little sticky in the fingers. In fact, I could cover the entire bottom of the canoe with pitch, but there's a disadvantage. It is sticky. It's hard to remove later. So I'm just getting the obvious cracks that have formed during the last day or two of drying. These are the big ones. I'm going to touch them up a little. A modern day boat maker might paint the entire boat with linseed oil, but I have something that I prefer to use on the rest of the canoe since I'm not going to use pitch. Here is some deer tallow. It's made by boiling down the fat from a white tailed deer. I do this during the winter when. Uh, during the hunting season when deer are available. And the tallow is kind of like grease. I'll rub some of that right into the log. The tallow actually has a little bit of its own moisture in here. And it will hopefully prevent the rest of the log from drying out too fast. And we'll just leave it like this. If this isn't enough, we can also keep wet sand under the bottom of the log during the next stage of our work. And it's especially important for me to do a good job on the ends of the canoe. That's where the end grain sees the outside air. The end grain has a tendency to dry much faster than cross grain in here. I think our crow friends across the river must have seen a fish hawk called an osprey that came by. They're going wild over there. Kind of some nice interruptions when you're doing this work by the river. All right. 
That's a nice job with the tallow. I think we're about through with that. And now I'm ready to roll the boat over and start on what will become one of the longest stages in working on the canoe. rolled over in the position that the, uh, the finished craft will be. The intended top is up, our greased bottom is down. And I've drawn some lines along the length of the canoe to define the finished shape. The charcoal line that you see here will eventually be what we call the gunnel or upper edge of the finished canoe. And all of this wood above it as well as the inside of the canoe must be removed. There's a tremendous amount of wood we're talking about well over a thousand, maybe twelve, thirteen hundred pounds of wood. Uh, if we searched around today, we would find that the adze, the big stone chisel, and the stone knife are not here. They're not up to this tremendous task. And we're entering the last and kind of most exciting stage of dugout creation. And we need a new tool which is far more powerful than, than the adze which flattened the bottom and the ends. And man had this tool from early times. It's called fire. What I've done to help control the fire is pack some red clay along the edges. Eventually, this red clay will move down and down as we burn and end up at this black line where it will stay to protect the gunnels. At this stage, it's not, not doing much more than holding my fire material, the kindling, and small sticks on top of the log. But of course, that's important. And now we need that essential tool, fire itself. And here I have uh, my primitive fire kit, simply two sticks that I'll spin together to create a fire and touch off a blaze on top of the canoe. I'm going to make a couple of adjustments here in the notch in my fireboard flint flake. That looks about right. I need an extension for my fire drill. This is just a simple cattail reed wrapped with a cattail leaf to prevent it from splitting. I want to get this pretty straight. That's good. Here is some tinder, bark of a cedar tree. Need a little ball of that for blowing a spark I'm going to create into a solid flame. I like to use some birch bark for a match, and we're ready to try and start a fire. down here. It's slowly smoldering.
We're taking a uh, day off from burning the canoe, which is coming quite well, by the way, and just relaxing uh, up by the house here, so to speak. Uh, and we have some important tasks to do. We want to sharpen up and uh, refit our tools, which have really suffered quite a bit of abuse uh, during the, the chopping and scraping of the outside of the canoe. And we'll talk about two classes of tools today. Uh, they're both rather different. The first class is cutting and scraping tools, and these are the tools that are usually most exciting for uh, people to talk about. Uh, many materials can be used. The material that can be found around here is this white stone. This is called quartz. I think everyone's familiar with it. And by striking a sharp blow against a piece of quartz, one can knock off a spall or a chip and this is usually very sharp. It has a naturally sharp edge. And quartz can be used to make cutting tools such as knives, piercing tools such as arrowheads. But it's a little harder to work than another material which was the favorite of most primitive peoples. That material is often referred to as chert, but we more commonly call it by the name flint. And here is flint, a beautiful, glassy, material that is very hard, but it cracks very easily. And that's the secret of its use. And unfortunately, there is no flint in Connecticut. The nearest source is the Hudson River Valley, south of Albany, and that's where I obtained this flint from. And primitive Indians who lived here would have obtained it from the same place, probably by trade. And we'll give an idea of how to make a tool out of this kind of flint. This is a large cobble. Cobbles this size probably never came back to Connecticut. They were worked on by people in the Hudson Valley. And the first tool to be used, of course, is called a large hammer. Here's the hammer. It's a stone hammer. And the object is to try and break off a large, long piece of flint that will be the size of a knife blade. And it's... There is a beautiful, beautiful chunk. Now, right away, this edge is extremely keen and sharp, and is actually a razor edge. So immediately upon finding flint and hitting it, I already have a razor-sharp tool, which can be used for many things. To give you an idea of how, how sharp it really is. I'm just taking the bark off this piece of wood. That's easy, but I can carve right into the piece of wood with the flint. So this is a razor-sharp edge. Now, a flint napper, as they're called, the one who works flint, in the Hudson Valley would have taken this piece and begun to work upon it. And uh, he'd have done that perhaps with a smaller hard hammer, but a preferred tool is called the second or soft hammer. Here's, here's a small hard hammer. If there are thick spots, I can strike these away with this small hard hammer. But now come the soft hammers of various sizes. These are deer's antlers, and if one is worried about the problem of obtaining a deer's antler, you don't really have to go deer hunting. You merely have to go antler hunting in late February or early March when the deer naturally drop their antlers. So they're available through many ways. And the object is to strike against the thinning edges and knock off pieces with the antler. And the antler knocks off long, thin pieces. Here are two pieces that I struck, if we can see them on close-up, they actually came off this single cobble. This one fit right here at one time. And this one fit exactly there. But you can notice what I've done to them. To save a little time, because this isn't a lesson in flint napping. We want to talk about tools in general and get back to our canoe before too long. This large piece and this one were almost identical in shape, which is a bit unusual. You can kind of see they're curved the same way. And to get from this stage to this stage, it's merely necessary to start whacking on this piece with a large hammer. And every time I hit it, a smaller piece comes off. Each piece that drops away is extremely sharp edge that's left behind is extremely sharp as well. 
That's the secret of flint. I'm accumulating some smaller pieces. I'll save these, of course, and eventually use them as razor knives for cutting other things. At some point, I'll grind the thinning edge of this flint. so that it doesn't break away so easily. It takes more material with it. All right, there's a beautiful piece. Now this, right at the moment, is waste material. But soon, I can turn this into an arrowhead, and I don't think it takes much imagination for you to see that this can become an arrow point. So we'll save these for future use. And I think you can see that with a few more judicious strokes, I will end up with a knife blade something like this. And when it got to this stage, a flint worker in the Hudson Valley would not have gone any further. This is what we call a cash blade or a trade blank. He'd have put this in a basket and started on another one. He'd have knocked off another large chunk like this, worked it down only to that stage, and then he'd have traded it, perhaps walking himself across country to another tribe and trade with that tribe. And the tribesman that received that piece would then make his decision as to what to make on it. Does he want a spear point, a scraping blade, a piercing blade, or a sawing blade, or whatever tool? And I'll take this blade, which is a little more finished, and go to the small antler hammer and try to finish it up for use on our canoe. And I have a sawing idea in mind. I've gone to a smaller hammer now. I'm removing smaller pieces.